In the last mini-lesson, we solved an example involving static friction. Static friction problems often ask about threshold situations, typically of the form, what's the maximum or minimum value that some quantity can have so that some object in the problem doesn't slide? In these threshold situations, the static friction force, F sub s, takes on its maximum value, mu sub s, coefficient of static friction, times F sub n, the normal force. In this mini-lesson, we work through another static friction example. The new feature here is that static friction is responsible for keeping an object moving in a circular arc at constant speed. So we will need to combine our knowledge of static friction, Newton's second law, and uniform circular motion. Suppose a car is driving on a flat horizontal road and has to round a curve of radius 37 meters. If the coefficient of static friction between the tires and the road is 0.78, how fast can the car round the curve before it starts to skid? Let's sketch what's going on in this problem. Here is an overhead view of a car rounding a curve at some speed v. The radius of the curve, we're told, is 37 meters. What this means is that the curve is the arc of a circle of radius 37 meters. Since the car is moving in a circular arc at constant speed, it's undergoing uniform circular motion. That means its acceleration vector points radially toward the center of the circle, perpendicular to the direction of motion, so that the car changes direction but not speed. The magnitude of this radial acceleration is v squared over r. If the acceleration points radially inward, then the net force must also point radially inward. That means that something must be exerting a horizontal force on the car, which points towards the center of the circular arc. We're going to switch from an overhead view to a head-on view in order to analyze the forces on the car. The horizontal axis in this head-on view will be a radial line. Now we need to identify the forces acting on the car. Gravity exerts a downward force, mg, where m is the mass of the car. This quantity, m, hasn't been specified in the problem, so hopefully it will drop out later on. That shouldn't stop us from referring to it now by some label. The ground exerts an upward normal force, f sub n, on the car's tires. That's it for vertical forces. What about horizontal forces? Let's assume we can ignore air resistance. That may or may not be a good assumption, but even if, it were to, even if we were to include air resistance, it acts opposite to the direction of motion, not radially inward. So it would not contribute to the radial component of the net force, the part responsible for keeping the car on a circular arc. The force that is responsible for the circular motion is static friction. If the road were frictionless, then the car would not round the curve regardless of which way the wheels point. It's only because the tires grip the road that the car is able to stay on the curve. Well, gripping the road is just static friction. To be completely accurate, there is undoubtedly a component of the static friction force pointing forward. The tires propel the car forward by pushing back on the ground, which makes the ground push forward on the tires via static friction. Once the car is traveling at constant speed, however, this forward static fi friction uh, force is pretty small, just large enough to counteract the slowing down effect of, say, air resistance. By contrast, the radial component of static friction has to be rather sizable in order to keep the car on the tight curve. So we'll just ignore the comparatively small forward component and approximate the static friction force as pointing entirely in the radial direction, as shown in the figure. With the forces identified, we're now ready to draw a free body diagram. We choose a coordinate system in which the horizontal axis points radially inward. All force vectors are parallel or anti-parallel to one of the axes, so there's no need to resolve vectors into components in this problem. Now let's apply Newton's second law in component form. First, the y components. Gravity and the normal force contribute to the y component of the net force. 
The car is stationary in the y direction, so the y component of acceleration is zero. From this, we find that the normal force is equal in magnitude to the car's weight. Now on to the radial component. The radial component of the net force is just F sub s, the static friction force. It therefore has to equal the mass of the car times the radial component of its acceleration. An object moving at speed v on a circle of radius r has a radial acceleration of v squared over r pointing inward. So F sub s has to equal mv squared over r. The static friction force must be less than or equal to its maximum value of mu sub s times the normal force. Therefore, we conclude that mv squared over r, the static friction force, is less than or equal to mu sub s times mg, the normal force. Solving this inequality for v gives v is less than or equal to the square root of mu sub s times g times r. Notice that the mass of the car does indeed drop out as we predicted earlier. Plugging in numbers, we find that the speed of the car has to be less than or equal to 16.8 meters per second in order for static friction to remain operative and for the car not to skid. We are now able to answer the question posed in the problem. How fast can the car round the curve before it starts to skid? The answer is 16.8 meters per second, which is 37.8 miles per hour, although it's probably safest not to push it to that limit. The value of solving the problem entirely in terms of symbols before plugging in numbers is that we can now see how the maximum non-skid speed depends on the road conditions and the tightness of the curve. If the road is wet or icy, that dramatically reduces the coefficient of static friction, which correspondingly reduces the maximum ski speed you can take the curve without skidding. Furthermore, we can see why you have to take tight curves more slowly than gentle curves. A tight curve means a small radius, r, which in turn means a small maximum safe speed. Finally, we can see that the maximum non-skid speed doesn't depend at all on how heavy the car is. It's the same for a Mini Cooper as it is for a Hummer.